the state of nature as a constant possibility that is an alternative to uh, the Commonwealth. Okay. Um, and last point about chapter um, 13 is this idea of justice that he mentions uh, in Paris, this is on page 78. He says, to this war of every man against every man, this also is consequent, he says, that nothing can be unjust. The notions, he says, of right and wrong, justice and injustice, have there no place. Where there is no common power, he says, there's no law. Where there's no law, there's no injustice. Force and fraud are in war the two cardinal virtues, right? So force and fraud are typically thought of as being vices. He's saying in this condition, not only are they not vices, but they can be perfectly rational uh, traits. Justice and injustice are none of the faculties either of the body nor mind. If they were, they might be in a man that were alone in the world, as well as his senses and passions. Instead, there are qualities that relate to men in society, not in solitude. So, uh, I want to be clear here that Hobbes' claim is not simply that justice doesn't apply. Injustice doesn't apply either. Like the concept of justice doesn't fit the situation. So the attempt to make judgments about justice misfires when we're trying to describe maybe actions that take place in the state of nature. So it would be like, I mean, it's a sort of conceptual mistake, he thinks, that this concept of justice or injustice doesn't fit the situation. You're making a mistake if you try to make that evaluation of actions that take place in the state of nature. Yeah. Isn't it fair to say that it doesn't apply at all? Wouldn't it just be subject to each individual person? Well, so justice here is um, distinguished from <coughs> judging something to be good. So he's going to give a very specific definition of what makes something just or unjust. And this is going to be, for him, an objective matter. So, uh, so an evaluation of something being good or bad in the state of nature certainly is subjective. Just the reflection of the desires we have. His claim here is that the concept of justice, uh, I mean, he hasn't quite said this, but I'll say it, is an, an objective matter. And it doesn't apply here. It would be like asking, um, what color is seven? Right? The concept of color doesn't fit with numbers. They don't have them. They don't have colors. Similarly, actions in the state of nature don't have a status of being just or unjust. His feelings about objectivity and subjectivity is very confusing at this then because so let me just interrupt you just for a second. Okay, it's important to keep in mind the distinction here between the underlying source of value, something being good or bad, and morality or justice. Those are not the same and you should not confuse them. Saying something is good is not the same as saying something is just. And he's given different analyses of each of them. Saying something is good is not the same as saying something is right. He's given different analyses of this. So, I'll, I'll say what I've said before again. The, on the big picture here, he's trying to generate um, a rational account to show that uh, on the basis of reason, we have reason to enter into a commonwealth and, now I'll say, and be just. 
He's trying to make that case from a subjective basis of value. And I said to you before, this is going to be a hard thing to do. He might not succeed, and you should worry about whether that's even possible. This is the point. Right? This is exactly what I think that you're worrying about right now. Yeah. It's a good word. about judgments of value 
that's, that's driving this. Also, so that there is no such law as a property and you know with different smart open, but there is no law that says that you cannot take somebody's property from that person. And if there was such a law, you would take that and it would be injustice. But there is no such concept in the state of nature as right. injustice. So that's, right. that's right. And there's no such concept in the state of nature as a civil law. Right. Because there's nobody to make such a law as long as we're in the state of nature. We're about to say that. So people are entitled to everything. Exactly what he said. Exactly. So uh, we're about to see him say almost exactly that. So there are no exclusive property rights in the state of nature. There is possession and physical control, as we would expect. Yeah. So there's no rights in the state of nature beyond your ability to There are no exclusive rights in the state of nature. Meaning every right that you have, everyone else has as well. Exactly. And that's just saying that there's no rights at all. Well, okay. So let's move on to chapter, um, chapter 14. So actually, at the end of 13 now, he foreshadows that, this, what I've been talking about over and over, that this horrible condition for each of us means that each of us should have a rational desire in order to satisfy whatever other desires we have, the most effective and rational means to do that is to try to achieve peace. Um, chapter 14. He starts here by talking, by giving us a few definitions, starting with the right of nature. And the right of nature, he says, <clears throat> is the liberty that each man has to use his own power as he will himself for the preservation of his own nature, that is to say, of his own life, and consequently, of doing anything which in his own judgment and reason he shall conceive to be the aptest means thereunto. Okay, so first of all, this right of nature is something that we all have. All of us have this right of nature. It's a right of nature. It's something that we all have in the state of nature, in our natural condition. And it's unlimited. Each of us is able to uh, exercise this right without any kind of limitation. And furthermore, I want you to notice that there are, he doesn't quite say this, but kind of, there are two parts to this. The first is, to use his power as he rolls himself for the preservation, uh, that's to say, of his own life, and consequently of doing anything which, of doing anything which in his own judgment and reason he shall conceive to be the aptest means thereunto. So I want to break this down into two parts, just to emphasize this. On the one hand, we can make judgments for ourselves. What kind of judgments are these? These are going to be judgments about value. These are going to be judgments about what's good, about what the best thing to do is. And this is going to be judgments, of, this just is, judgments about how to satisfy our desires. So nobody can, nobody in the state of nature, nobody can tell us what to do. The right of nature gives us our right to judge for ourselves which actions are most valuable. And of course, the right of nature gives us the right to do that, to act on the basis of those judgments. So we can do anything that we judge to be good. That is, anything that we have a desire for. We can judge as best we can the